Welcome to episode eight of Free Kiwis. It's our very great pleasure today to welcome Carl, Carl Dufresne, who is uh, a long-standing member of the Fourth Estate in, in New Zealand. Uh, Carl has been a freelance journalist since 2002, and he is also an erstwhile editor of The Dominion, which is one of the predecessors of The Dominion Post. Uh, He's a longtime columnist for major New Zealand newspapers and a contributor to magazines such as The Listener and The Spectator and has kept his own blog since 2008. And I'm delighted to say that Carl is also uh, a musician and and has written a book about uh, American blues music. Is that right? Well, no, not exactly. Um, it's, uh, its title was A Road Tour of American title, uh, Song Titles uh, oh. with, a sub, with a subtitle from... I'm having trouble remembering it now, from, from Memphis to Mendocino or from Mendocino to Memphis. And really what I did was with my wife made three road trips through various parts of the United States visiting towns and cities that are named in the titles of songs. Oh, I see. So, you know, <laughs> by the time I get to Phoenix, 24 hours from Tulsa, yes. Kansas City, you know, um, Mendocino, I just mentioned Memphis, Tennessee, so on and so forth. I, mm. think, I think we went to 25 um, towns and cities, some of them very interesting, um, some of them kind of quite well known, some a bit more offbeat and quirky, like uh, Luke and Bach, Texas. I don't know whether you're familiar with that. Um, it's, a, it's a country music anthem. Um, looking back, Texas, everybody in America knows that song. Right. Certainly everybody in Texas knows that song. So, yeah, and, and in each place we, I sort of wrote about the town itself. I wrote about the song, who sang it, who wrote it, who recorded it, any other sort of interesting quirky facts about the history of the song. And I talked about, I wrote about the, the kind of type of town or city it was. Um, fantastic experience. Uh, lost a lot of money. <laughs> on the project, I mean, very modest sales. I would have hoped to get it published overseas, but that didn't happen. But who cares? My wife and I had a fantastic time doing it. Sounds so like a lovely project indeed. It was a great yeah. project, and it was something yeah. that I'd kind of been fantasising about for years, and I suddenly realised I was in a position to do it. So away we went. Lovely, yeah. yeah. Well, it's really good to have you here, Carl, because, you know, you do have a great deal of experience in the, the media, and one of the things that I'd very much like to open up with is the state of the media in New Zealand and elsewhere. Uh, I understand you've recently written a, a piece for The Spectator about the state of politics in New Zealand in which you, you touch on some of the media issues. And what we, we've seen in the last, well, couple of weeks is a, ve a veteran broadcaster, Sean Plunkett, being deplatformed for, from a, a radio station. And He's not. He's not. Certainly not the first to have suffered that that kind of fate. And and you also draw attention to, uh, quite rightly, I think, the something of a, a fawning attitude towards our prime minister in the, in the media at the moment, and a general sense of bias and lack of balance. Now you've been around a long time. This is is this the first time you've seen anything like this come along? Yeah, I would describe the state of the media in New Zealand right now as worse than parlous. Um, and what astonishes me is the speed with which this deterioration has taken place. I'm old school. Um, I entered journalism straight from school. It was in the days before you were required to, uh, to get um, some sort of tertiary qualification before you could become a journalist. Um, and I was brought up in the era when uh, the, there were certain rules and principles that went uh, unquestioned, like um, neutrality, objectivity, I'll come back to objectivity, um, balance, um, telling both sides of the story. And the first thing any journalist should learn is that there are always two sides to a story, sometimes more than two sides to a story. Now, even not quite then, but uh, later on as uh, journalism became a subject taught by politics originally and later universities, that whole notion of objectivity came under attack. And the argument was that uh, how, could anybody, uh, how could anybody be truly objective? There's a, there's a sort of core of truth to that argument, um, but nonetheless, objectivity uh, remains a, uh, an essential kind of principle. If, if the public is going to have any trust in 
the media and journalism. They need to be confident that the media are being even-handed in the way they uh, approach things. And that's gone by the board. And that's gone by the board because we now have a new generation of journalists, all the old school guys like me, not just guys, women too, lots and lots of talented, um, uh, very capable women that I've worked with them, they're all gone. They've been sort of shown the door for various reasons over a sustained period of time. And so now we've got a new generation of journalists who have been taught to disregard the notion of objectivity, taught that it's a myth because all along, the theory goes that all along the through the journalistic process, um, people are making judgments about what's newsworthy, what's not. Um, who's worth reporting, who's not, so on and so forth. Uh, and that's true, but those decisions can be made along um, along neutral, if you like, lines um, where you stand back uh, from whatever it is you're writing about and, and try to distance your own personal feelings. And journalists manage to do this. Mm. Um, they managed to do it perfectly successfully, and while they did, the, the, the press enjoyed general public respect, that's that's all gone. Objectivity, as I say, is, is now considered uh, to be a myth, something unattainable. And the moment you discard the, the idea of objectivity, you give every journalist license to spin a story however he or she wants. And that's, that's the danger. And in the past, you had a bunch of crusty old sub-editors and news editors and what have you, um, a layer of these people sitting above reporters, basically intercepting stuff that was plainly unbalanced or unfair, throwing the story back at the reporter and saying, this is no good, go and do it again. Or, okay, you put one side of the story here, go and talk to somebody else, get, you know, round the story out with the other side. That doesn't seem to happen anymore. So journalism has become highly politicised. Um, journalists are now encouraged to insert their own value judgments, and this is just, this is perfectly routine. And so every day you'll read uh, stories which make sweeping assertions about statements being sexist or racist. These are value judgments. Um, obviously, in the eyes of the journalist, uh, a statement might be might be racist or sexist, but these are often highly disputable. But they're going all through the editing process, such as it is these days, and getting it to print, and no one challenges them. And the gradual effect of this, I believe, uh, is to corrode public confidence in the media and public the public expectation that, that they can rely on newspapers and TV and radio to report things honestly and fairly. And, uh, and I, you know, I regard that as a very, a very tragic thing. I'm kind of over. I went through a sort of grieving process when this was happening. I'm sort of, it's like going through the five stages, five stages of, yeah, yeah of, of, of grieving. Um, I've I've got I've worked through all that now, and I try not to let myself get um, get too upset by it. But when I look at what happened, what has happened to the industry that I spent my working life in, uh, I, I'm it's almost it's almost heartbreaking. And I think of all the good, capable, committed people who were genuinely committed to the principles of good journalism, all gone. Um, and I look at what remains, and I hear constantly from people who say they no longer bother to watch the TV news, they no longer um, subscribe to a daily paper, uh, that they've given up on it. Yeah. Um, and that's sad because the flow of information, the exchange of information, the exchange of news and comment and opinion is a crucial part of an informed democracy. And what's happening now is that people are being polarised and driven into opposing camps where they're exposed only to views that they agree with. And that's very, very dangerous. But the mainstream media in New Zealand have been complicit in this by basically shutting down ideas and opinions that they don't like. Latest example, Michael Bassett in the New Zealand Herald. That's right. And of course, New Zealand has become very biased, I think, in its mainstream media. And would you say that it's worse here than elsewhere? I mean, internationally, we see similar phenomena. And, and you know, I certainly take your point about polarisation. I mean, if you look at the United States, for example, there's you know, Fox News in one corner and CNN in another, and there's various print media there that comes from different angles. But what occurs to me about New Zealand is that it's almost unipolar. There, there seems to be very little, even in the centre, let alone centre-right, or, or, or uh, other than various blogs and and alternative media, there's some of that. There's Magic Talk and uh, News Talk. 
Right, so a so small amount of talkback radio yeah. codes. Yes, you're, you're, you're correct. Overwhelmingly, the thrust in the media, print and electronic, is, 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 is kind of ideologically homogenous, and it's all looking at things from a leftist perspective. There are exceptions. Um, James has just mentioned News Talk ZB. I mean, you can't ignore the pull of a broadcaster like Mike Hosking, who mm. who, who reaches a huge uh, audience on on his breakfast show. And yet, the prime uh, minister has just uh, well, that's pulled, r- pulled herself from his show. That's right, <laughs> because and and there was a terrific column uh, only a day or two ago by uh, Barry Soper, you know, veteran, probably the longest serving member of the press gallery by some margin. Um, so he's seen, he's worked with a lot of prime ministers, so he's seen a lot of them, and he wrote a very, very scathing column a day or two ago about about uh, Jacinda Ardern not having the, I was going to say not having the balls, that's not the appropriate Let's word. Let's say courage. But, but not, <laughs> not, yeah, not having the, yeah. Or even the principle, perhaps, yeah, that, that a prime minister not, ought to be accessible to Not being prepared to front up and answer mm-hmm. awkward questions. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's, she's, it seems to me that Jacinda Ardern, he also made the point that uh, unlike a lot of, or most previous prime ministers, she's never really developed Face to face, she does. She has very few face to face dealings with journalists. It's all in the, in the press conference where she can pick and choose. So she can choose the reporters she thinks are going to ask soft questions. Uh, she can go on Radio New Zealand where she's almost one hundred percent assured that she's not going to be given a, 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 a troubled by a, a, an aggressive grilling. It just doesn't happen mm-hmm. on Morning Report. Um, but you do have, as I say, you've got outliers like. Mike Hosking, you've got some broadcasters on Magic Talk. Um, Sean Plunkett, as you said, he's gone. Uh, um, uh, John Banks, uh, with a lot of contributory fault on his own part, he's gone. Um, You've got Peter Williams hanging in there. Peter Williams, is I I describe him as moderate centre-right, but moderate, essentially. So he's still there. And then you've got occasional... I'm a bad sleeper, so I sometimes listen to all night talk back. And there are a couple of hosts on News Talk ZB from midnight till five in the morning um, who who lean to the right. And, and and a couple of them are very good. One I would mention in particular is Tim Beveridge. Um, and then you've got Mike Hosking's, I'm not sure whether she's his wife, she's certainly his partner. Um, and I've just my mind's just gone blank, but she hosts uh, a, a program between five and six. So her show precedes. Hosking show, and her name will come to me in a moment. I mean, I, I know it well. I listen to her most days, and she's she's she takes a, a refreshingly, um, uh, shall we say, unorthodox approach to to politics. So it's interesting you were talking about you know what it used to be like, and um, it, it, is there anything positive about the way things have gone? Because you might say, well, in the old days there was this sort of class of people mainly you know they would say uh, people would say old white guys they were sort of gatekeeping and there was this bottleneck of information and only what they stamped their approval on could get through and in a way I, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed and surprised at how badly things have gone because if you told me in the 90s and this the internet was come you know started being used more commonly in the 90s and 2000s if you told me at that time that there, there was going to be this huge opening up of information, people were going to be able to put videos online, to put blogs online, I'd have said, that's fantastic. There'll be all these citizen journalists, people will ha- be able to put their own views out there without people arbitrarily stopping them. So I- isn't there something good in that? And, and also, is there any hope that this process, which is is going to happen, I mean, the cat's out of, out of the bag now, right? Is there any hope that this process can kind of self-correct and, and we will get back to something less polarizing? Yeah, well, you raise a lot of interesting uh, points there. I mean, uh, I agree that when the internet transformed communication, in theory, and I commented on this in a recent blog post, uh, this was going to kind of liberate uh, comment and opinion and and open it up. Uh, but as you yourself say, it's um, it's it's had a it's had a, a polarizing effect. It's driven we talk about the echo chamber effect. It's driven people into opposing camps where they no longer talk to each other, and that's taken over the function of what we used to call the broad church press, where you got your news and information from your daily paper, and you could rely on that daily paper. Often they were conservative, essentially. And I'd be, I'm not going to be dishonest and argue that the mainstream press in New Zealand hasn't historically been conservative, but they were committed 
to fairness and balance. So they opened up their columns to all manner of uh, shades of opinion and their letters, their letters to the editor, likewise. Uh, so you, if you got your daily paper each day, uh, you could rely on it to, to give you a, a, a reasonable spread of, of comment and interpretation on what was going on in the world. And that's no longer the case. Um, does that answer your question? Possibly not, or maybe only partially. Well, I think um, James is wondering where, where things might be going, okay. as, yes, as I thank do you. as well. And that's thank a, you. Yeah. Now, uh, Michael, you mentioned that in, in the United States you've got, let's say you've got the, the New York Times, which sounds like, sounds like a nightmarish place. Uh, you know, their, 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 their newsroom sounds like it's inhabited by a lynch mob, basically. Awful. Always been a stuffy, pompous, stodgy paper, but it's still stuffy and pompous and self-important. But on top of that, you've got this, inf this nauseating layer of, of wokeness where anybody who doesn't subscribe to the sort of ideological line of the newsroom gets basically gets thrown under a bus. Shocking. But as you point out, on the other end of the, or the other side of the political spectrum, you've got outfits like Fox News. Um, I never watch Fox News. Um, I only know I only know what I read about it. Um, somewhere, somewhere in there, there's a middle ground that's that's being that's been lost, uh, and and you know, I just think that's a retrograde uh, development. Now, coming back to the question of whether there's any going to be any countervailing force in New Zealand, Chris Trotter, who you probably know, is a, he's a lifelong hardcore socialist, mm -hmm. but he's a courageous um, champion of, of, of free speech. He wrote a very perceptive uh, blog post just a week or so ago where he raised the, he raised the danger that there's this sort of mounting backlash, which is kind of subterranean at the moment. There's a huge... He thinks, and I think, there's a, a huge uh, developing backlash, which, as I say at the moment, uh, is largely out of sight, coming from fairly ordinary mainstream New Zealanders um, against this relentless tide of wokeness. Um, and it covers a whole lot of things. It covers issues like, well, you know, the old, the old things like race and Maori place name seems to be a, something that really gets people inflamed. Little on a really prosaic level, little things like cycleways. People get so angry at vast sums of money being spent on cycleways that hardly anybody uses. And I say that as a keen cyclist. Yeah. Um, uh, and Chris Trotter was saying, "Well, where's the where's the um, kind of countervailing uh, force in the media? It's not there at the moment." And he's and he's saying it's not only not there in the media, but it's not there politically too. And he raises the very real danger that this backlash will suddenly manifest itself in some sort of quite angry right-wing uh, reaction. I'm not, I'm not entirely with him on that because I think New Zealanders are basically essentially fairly passive, fair-minded people. They're not given to political extremes, never have been. But having said that, nonetheless, there is this huge backlash of resentment. I hear it all the time. As I said to you before, people ring me up and say, I've, I've just cancelled my subscription to the Dominion Post. I can't stand it any longer. I haven't listened to Morning Report for, for two or three years. It's just unbearable. Um, so you've got this huge kind of reservoir of, mm. of uh, dissatisfaction and resentment. And ultimately, yeah. it's going to come out time, and no one's kind of harnessing it, with the exception of people like Mike Hosking. Mm. Um, yeah. So there's, there are many New Zealanders perhaps who feel that their world is not being represented, their viewpoints are not being represented in the media or, or perhaps even in, in politics. I, I mean, we saw, I, I, you know, I think David Seymour did an incredible job during the last term of government as a one-man band, as it were, and, and he was rewarded quite richly at the, at the election by being join, joined by nine extra ACT MPs. Now, Perhaps that could be a pressure valve because you should, certainly wouldn't describe him as in any sense extreme. I, right. I mean, he, he he's a libertarian. He has perhaps you know somewhat non-mainstream views, but he does he's, think tax is inherently exploitative. So sure, <laughs> <laughs> so he, he does seem to think tax is inherently exploitative. But he's, so. he, 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 <laughs> he's no demagogue. <laughs> no, he's that's, not a rebel. That, that's right. And so one, one could perhaps see if the National Party are unwilling to 
represent perhaps their traditional base, the, that act will gradually encroach on that well, and, and become and bigger. And, um, and, and, and that's likely. I mean, uh, you, perhaps the election of nine um, ACT MPs was an early sign of this kind of developing political backlash. I don't know. They, if it is, they're not doing much with it at this stage. As for the National Party, they're basically missing an action. Um, and I, I put down to the fact that partly down or perhaps even largely down to the fact that, um, well, for a start, they've never been a party of principle. No. They've always been a party of pragmatism, basically, do whatever is required to get into power and stay there. Um, uh, you know, there, there are two Ps in the National Party kind of um, creed and, and, and one is far more important than the other. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I've lost my thread for a moment. Um, uh, I, think, uh, I think part of the problem with the Nats is that um, – Judith Collins doesn't know what sort of leader she wants to be. She originally developed this image as Crusher Collins, tough, no-nonsense, tell it like it is. And I think she's she's floundering now. She She's kind of relinquished that role. She's trying to come over as – she's doing a Jacinda, I think. Hmm. Um, and I think she's been cowed and intimidated by the media, which – in contrast to their approach with the Prime Minister, has been, and I'm speaking particularly of News Hub News, I don't know whether either of you watched Three News, but um, their uh, aggressive behaviour toward the National Party, and particularly due to the Collins and, uh, individually, has been appalling. And it's mm. been sustained over a period of many, many months, right through the election campaign last year, and it's still going on now. And I think that basically managed to cower her. But, but if you're right, and I suspect you are, that there's a huge swathe of New Zealanders who are starting to feel a little frustrated by the state of the media and, and perhaps by the fact that perhaps, you know, David Seymour aside, that they don't have anybody speaking for them at the national level in, in parliament. How can, how can the, the National Party fail to see this? Do you think they are so intimidated by the media they just won't stand up to them? Because... It occurs to me that if if Judith Collins went back to being crusher and really gave it to the to TV3 or whoever it was that, that was yeah. giving her a hard time, she'd get a lot of applause. Well, one would like to think so, but then um, only within the past couple of weeks you had Simon Bridges laying into Andrew Costa, I think uh, probably with some justification, uh, accusing him of wokeness, of being a wokester, I think, which is a wonderful term. And uh, Ju Judith Collins kind of slapped him down. Uh, she she didn't like this at all. Perhaps he, uh, he's he, he's a little bit of a threat to her still. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's probably part of it. Uh, but I think it's also she. I don't know. She may just be reading the public mood wrongly. Maybe I'm reading the public mood wrongly. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she probably is reading the public mood wrongly, and I I, I don't think there's anyone, certainly not the National Party, tapping into this. As I say, this rising tide of of, of resentment at, at wokery. So let's actually turn to this vast tide of wokeness, uh, as you termed it, because, of course, you know, pe people have the right to put forward ideas, as I'm sure you agree, you know, socialist ideas, yes. libertarian ideas, Christian ideas, atheist ideas, whatever. Mm -hmm. So is there something about this particular movement, whatever you want to call it, um, identity politics or whatever, is there something about this particular movement that you think is unusual and in some ways more malign than just any other sort of political uh, ideology or political movement? Is it unusual in some way? I mean, is it, is it like other things you've seen in your life? It's, it's quite unlike anything I've seen. And, I, you know, I've been on this earth for 70 years, and, and this is, um, this is all, what is happening now is totally new to me. I don't think I've ever in my life... Uh, and I followed politics fairly closely for quite a long time. I don't think I've ever in my life felt more pessimistic about um, about the state of politics in New Zealand. I've never seen a phenomenon like the one we've got now. And what's kind of almost literally breathtaking about it is the speed with which it's happened. Um, James and I are both too young to remember the counterculture movement of the 60s. I, I was born during it, but I certainly don't remember it, and James is much younger than me. You, you think this is bigger than that and faster than that? Uh, I think it's potentially more dangerous in the long term. Um, you know, at the time of the counterculture, uh, mainstream society sort of uh, 
kept functioning um, uh, and all this sort of disturbance, creative destruction, whatever you want to call it, was was going on sort of on the fringes and it certainly commanded public attention. I mean, look back in 1968, the student riots, the National Democratic Party Convention, all that sort of stuff. Um, that was a very, very turbulent time. Uh, I think the tone and character of what's going on now is feels to me quite different. Do you, th- do you think it's that the institutions are more captured than they were by the counterculture? Most certainly, unquestionably. And when you talk about institutions, you, 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 you'd have to include the, the one that you work for, the ones that you work for, universities. We would. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a big part of the problem. Universities, media, um, government departments, um, I mean, the, the, the extent to which government departments and government agencies have been captured by wokeism, uh, and again, it's happened very quickly, but very completely, is, is quite astonishing. And I, you know, you've, you've, I struggle to see where this all came from. But what I do know is that it does not represent mainstream New Zealand. And mainstream New Zealand is excluded from all this. And they will put up with that for a for a period of time, but eventually people are going to say, hang on, this is this is crazy. This is going on. They will get tired of being bombarded daily, relentlessly, with uh, examples of, of, of wokeism, whether it relates to, you know, gender politics or climate change or, um, or uh, racism, um, <laughs> cycle ways. <laughs> uh, it's just... So, so maybe this is a good time to just focus in on on some of these particular issues because you know it could be that they have a, they woke have a point in, in, in some of these issues or it could not be you know and the only way of really finding out is to yeah. drill down into the issue. So let's talk briefly maybe about uh, Maori wards because it came up in your Spectator article and, and and I don't I'm not sure if I have strong views on this but I can I think I can sympathize with. With both sides, but w- would you like to say what, what just put your view? Of I didn't. I didn't specifically uh, talk about the Maori Wars. Just as an introductory observation, I would say that I absolutely agree that New Zealanders don't know nearly enough about their own history. I, I think James said Maori Wards actually, oh, but, Maori but, wards. but oh, let's sorry. let's talk about the history yeah. curriculum first, sorry. since we are. We'll do that too. Yeah, we'll, yeah. yeah. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> What did you think I said? Uh, Maori Wars. Okay, wars Maori, no. Maori Wars. It's, it's yeah. the Canadian accent yeah. there. Yeah. Wards and wars. So, sorry. Okay, um, should we do wards first? And Maori then wars? Wards. Well, I think, you know, I think, you know, um, I agree that Maori should be represented at every level of, of government, but I don't think you should compromise and undermine or totally jettison basic democratic principles to achieve that. And I've argued for a long time that, um, you know, point one, Maori represent, depending which statistic you read, um, 13 and a half or 16 percent of the population. Um, there are lots of very, very capable Maori people out there, um, some of whom have put themselves forward uh, for election to local councils, lots of them now sitting in parliament. Um, I mean, we don't we don't rely on the Maori seats anymore to deliver Maori MPs. I think we have something like, off the top of my head, something like twenty eight um, MPs of Maori uh, descent. I think uh, David Farrar and his blog as well published some statistics to show that Maori are not underrepresented no. in local government either. No, no, apparently they are not, um, and that illustrates my point that uh, that if good Maori candidates put themselves forward and. Maori voters go out and support them at the polling booth, they will get elected. And history um, history supports that. We, you know, there are lots of Maori councillors um, uh, sitting on New Zealand um, councils. We've had we've had Maori mayors, um, and I think if they're if they're good candidates, they can rely on general support, not just kind of support from one particular ethnic or, or, or racial interest group, Howie Tamati. Um, Howie Tamati, you could argue, was, uh, was a, a rare case. You probably don't know who Howie Tamati is, but he was a rugby league hero. He served on the New Plymouth District Council for, I think, 16 years. So he, was, he was safely re-elected every time he put himself up for office. Um, we've had a Maori mayor within relatively recent times in Porirua, um, who commanded support across the board. Um, we've had Maori councillors in Wellington. 
uh, Maori councillors in the Hutt Valley, Maori councillors in Hawke's Bay. Well, the record shows that if good Maori candidates put themselves forward and Maori voters get out and, and, and vote, then they will be returned. And so... Um, Perhaps not only Maori voters as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure many many yeah. of them attract widespread support. And, yes, indeed. In fact, the, um, the leader of the opposition for most of the last term of parliament, as, as well as the kingmaker of that of that parliament, yeah. were, were both yeah. Maori people. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and and that's been the case. And I remember several years ago, I wrote a column, when I was still writing a column for the Dominion Post, I, I wrote a column about this, basically, I think, repeating what Kelvin Davis um, said in Northland, that Maoris need to get off their sorry, Māori, need to get off their asses and vote. Um, and uh, I took up this theme in a, in a column and, and I was subsequently contacted by two guys, one of whom was a long-serving uh, Wellington City Councillor, Māori. Um, another had been a long-serving uh, Māori Councillor in the hut and they both agreed with me that uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't do this at the expense of, of uh, democratic principles. Um, and, and democratic principles, to me, are compromised and undermined when you um, create a, a separate sort of category of, of voter along racial lines. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, well, we have, we have geographical wards already. Why, what's the difference with Maori wards? Well, I think there's a very obvious difference. Geographical wards uh, are, are a matter of, are created and, and drawn up as a matter of administrative efficiency as much as anything, um, and to ensure fair that every part of a, a, a council area or electorate or whatever is, is is fairly represented. The moment you start bringing in designated Maori wards, um, you're introducing a totally new dynamic and people being elected solely on the, on the basis of their race. Presumably, they're only going to be accountable and responsible to people of, of the same race. I just don't think that flies. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, um, one objection I think you can't use against it uh, is the idea that it very it, it, it strays from the one person one vote principle. Because the fact is, the, the fact that the, these wards are defined by ethnicity rather than geography, it, it still means that you have you know equal voting power. It's not the, it's not like in the states, for example, where in elections to the Senate you have much more power if you're in Wyoming than than in California. So so that's not that's not a, a particular issue. Um, but you know, you raise this issue about well, you def you defining people in this context by by ethnicity, um, at least in this narrow context. And I mean, Michael could probably talk about this more as a, as an uh, academic psychologist uh, by training. But there does seem to be evidence, and it's interesting to me because in some ways there's some evidence that points in both directions. One direction is that it seems that if you divide people up and say you you people are in different sets, and in whatever whatever way you do. And I've seen experiments where they just give people different color T-shirts, and then very quickly they start acting in way in ways that, sadly, you might expect. They start acting in a kind of tribal fashion and hating on the people with blue T-shirts, even though they've just been given a green T-shirt a few seconds ago. So there's that there's that tendency to sort of um, if we if we define ourselves in certain ways, then we also divide ourselves. And at the same time, um, there's a lot of literature in, in democratic theory about social capital and how if people uh, get together as groups and they have good, strong communities, uh, then that actually can help democracy because they can interact and they, they form social bonds. And So um, that, that, that's a valid thing, isn't it, to, to see yourself as Maori and to be part of a community. And so wh why shouldn't that be, be represented in, on the political level? Well, as I say, it, 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 um, simply because it changes the basis on which uh, people are uh, elected um, to, to office and... and I'm also concerned at the possibility that you're going to have Maori councillors who, who feel that they're only responsible and accountable to Maori voters. And that completely uh, changes the dynamic of, of government uh, in, in politics in New Zealand. Underlying all this, I think there's a, there's a, there's a bigger issue. I mean, what is happening at the moment is that um, society is being encouraged to break up into minority interest groups. Um, each pushing their own agenda uh, uh, across a whole variety of, of, of things. Um, and what's being damaged in this process is the notion that actually as a community, there are a hell of a lot of important things where we have interests in, in common. And I think that these areas where we have interests in common are, are kind of being shoved aside by all these areas in which we're 
almost at each other's throats and lobbying furiously for special right to privileges for particular groups. Um, you know, we talk about we talk about Maori councillors, and really speaking, this is a this goes down like a cup of cold sick, I know. But really speaking, we're talking about part Maori councillors, and one issue underlying all this that intrigues me is that um, all the Maori activists who talk about the pernicious effects of colonialism, et cetera, et cetera, almost all of them, if not all of them, I imagine all of them, um, come partly from um, European stock themselves. And I, I don't quite understand how they can, they're perfectly entitled to embrace their Maori heritage. Everybody's free to decide which part of their heritage um, they they are most proud of or that they identify with. I've got no argument with that whatsoever. Um, but they can't they can't easily just cast off the fact that they're personally contaminated with the with the taint of, of colonialism themselves because they've all got European forebears as well. I don't know how they well, you, rationalize you, that. You, you you can't sort of undo the the past. It is it is no. what it is to a large mm. extent. Mm. But just to, to go back to the issue of um, you know ethnically based representation, we do of course have Maori seats in mm. uh, the national parliament, and, mm. and we have had I think since about eighteen sixty. Yes. Um, now, one might comment that that's a different kind of scenario because in the national parliament we have a government and an opposition, whereas in the local body. There's no opposition as such. It's just a bunch of councillors who mm. represent their wards and they form factions and so on. Mm. But it's not set up with a formal opposition. Do you, do you think that makes a difference? And if not, how, how would you distinguish, if you do, the Māori ward situation mm. from the long-standing Māori seats in the national parliament? Well, first observation I would make is that um, uh, some councils are being split along, kind of. Um, Party lines in an informal sense. In an informal mm. sense, no, sometimes in a formal sense. Um, in Wellington, you've got Labour councillors, you've got you've got you've got Green councillors, um, and and uh, in municipal politics, councils are elected to make decisions on behalf of all um, all the citizens. Um, and in that respect, I think there is a, a kind of distinction with. Well, Parliament obviously is too, but you, as you yourself said, it's, Parliament is divided more rigidly along along party lines. Um, that's probably not a very satisfactory answer to your question. No. Do you, well, w here's a different question perhaps. Um, is it the existence of Māori wards in particular or specifically that you're arguing against or the process by which they're being brought about, which is that the government passed under urgency mm. legislation that ruled out referenda on mm. it? Mm. Um, so one could accept perhaps the idea that Māori wards would be legitimate if they were voted for by a majority of constituents in, in, a, in a local body, uh, whereas yeah. they're not legitimate if they're sort of foisted well, by, by fiat. I yeah. certainly think the process was, was hopelessly wrong and dishonest because uh, obviously this was part of uh, the Labour Party agenda going into the election. No, nothing was said about it. It was dropped on the country at very sh with minimal notice. The whole thing was rushed through in a matter of uh, days, as I recall. Um, councils that were that were known to favour um, Maori wards were encouraged in advance and given time to make submissions. Uh, so they were given an advantage over the vast body of people who might have opposed them and who didn't have time to make submissions. So that whole process was shockingly flawed. Um, and now I've lost my thread again. What was the second well? Point? Well, if if, if that, that hadn't happened yeah. and and okay, a Maori ward was put to a referendum and look, the I referendum. Look, I suppose if, if if Maori wards were supported by the majority of electors, what possible? No, I probably wouldn't um, object. I certainly wouldn't object any anywhere near so strenuously to them. But the but the fact is that wherever the issue has been put to a referendum, the voters overwhelmingly the gone referendum. against them. Um, and we're either a democracy where the majority will prevails or we're not. And that's another thing that concerns me, that this democracy seems to be 
being inverted, you know, well, it's a, it's a fundamental t tenet of democracy that the majority will prevails. But what we're seeing now um, is uh, a tendency to dismiss majority, the majority will as a, as a tool of you know, white su supremacy or oppression of minority groups. Yeah, I mean, uh, it might be a good time. I just wanted to, to bring in this uh, article that I mentioned by Janine Hayward, who's a professor of political, oh, yes, political science at Otago. In the newsroom, it's called Award by any other name, just as Democratic. And uh, I know that some people argue that you, sh you shouldn't use majority voting in, in the cases of minority rights. But she has a slightly different argument, which is just that um, she says that, you know, as, as things are in New Zealand, you can make a ward on the basis of trying to represent certain community groups. And you can do that with any community group, so she claims. And she has examples, including the, uh, the Wanaka Ward delivers three councillors to the Queenstown Lake District Council, et cetera, et cetera. And she says, well, this doing, doing Maori wards is just like that. And so having a requirement that Maori wards have, a, have to be confirmed by a referendum is actually discriminatory because you can make other, other wards. Well, I would come back to my distinct, the distinction I made before that wards, as, as, as things stand at the moment, wards are created on geographical lines. Uh, under this proposal, they will be created on ethnic lines. And I think that's just a fundamental, uh, a fundamental difference, and I think it's anti-democratic. And, peop and people obviously care about that more. I mean, that, that's the thing. I, I don't think anybody is going to really care too much about making a new board for a particular district. And I also think that, I don't know if she has other examples up her sleeve, but in that article, I didn't find examples of non-geographical community groups. She says, oh, in New Zealand, you can make wards based on any co yeah. any community of interest you want. Well, what are the examples of other community of, communities of interest that have been made wards that aren't just geographical regions? I, I suppose you could say, you could argue that historically there have been rural wards and on provincial district councils, and you could argue that they primarily represent uh, represent farmers. But only by accident. They're uh, still uh, geographical. Yeah, yeah, they're still geographical. And and as it happens, I think the general trend is for even rural wards to be abolished so that everybody, all council candidates, uh, are, are elected. Uh, I forget what the, they're elected at large. That's the term. So they're, they're councillors at large. That is to say they are elected by people from throughout the um, council area uh, to represent people from throughout that constituency. I, I actually think the fundamental issue is what you said before, that what we really want ultimately is a sense that we're one group of people, you know, with important cultural and sexual and yeah. other kinds of differences, different political views, different religious views, but ultimately we see ourselves as a body politic uh, whereby we can be well represented by somebody of a different ethnicity, a different sex, a different religion, and so on, because we agree on the fundamentals. And I, I, I worry that, you know, in addition to all of this political polarisation that's going on, we're, we're being driven into different camps, yeah. whether we like it or not, in a way. And, and to make things like race salient seems to me a mistake that, that actually... People ought to celebrate their cultures. Of course, they should. And 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 but, you know, I, I feel a, a certain pride in in some elements of Maori culture, even though it, it's not mine. It's not mine to actually feel proud of. Really, when when I came back to New Zealand from Australia, I, I was in this very building actually giving a class. And, and I heard a welcoming on the marae, and it brought a tear to my eye. It literally did. It was like, I'm home. I agree with you entirely. I, I, I don't think it's possible to grow up in New Zealand and not absorb um, a, a, a strong element of, of, of Maori influence, mm -hmm. um, whether, it's, whether it's music or um, you know, the rituals on, on the marae, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think most New Zealanders, like you, respect uh, Maori culture, take pride in it, and I think that's been the case for a very, very long time. I mean, how many people in New Zealand know that in the very early years of the 20th century, we had a, an acting prime minister who was Maori, Sir James Carroll? Mm -hmm. um, we need to know more about, about our own history. So I think it's a, it's a dangerous it's a dangerous misconception to argue that the two racial groups have 
historically been at each other's throats. It's just it's just not true. All the history kind of demonstrates. If you go back to the um, no Maori, no tour movement, Indeed. the Springbok tour process of 80, 81, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of Pākehā goodwill. There was uh, the was it the Maui. Battle of Manus Street that took place in World War Two. Do well, you know about that? Yeah, you, you yeah. Well, that's um. There's, there, I mean, the, the, the historical details of that are murky, but it does seem that uh, there was an element involved in of of of, of uh, um, New Zealanders being uh, reacting to perceived American racism toward Maori. Um, but as I say, that the historical details are, are very very murky and. Um, and there was just it was funny you should mention it because just within a few days, um, a historian from Masterton who uh, has written about the so-called Man- Battle of Manus Street, and he's delved into the archives and he's drilled down quite deep and found that it's kind of become a bit of an urban myth. Um, uh, there were a couple of uh, a couple of outbreaks of um, uh, violence between local servicemen and American servicemen, two different ones. Um, one in Manor Street, one in Cuba Street, um, but the as I say, he's kind of exposed the the whole myth of the. I see, Manus but Street. but what but what, what what is true is that the, the New Zealand Armed Forces have a long history of yes. of you know inter, integrated service yes. and and. Even when there was a Maori battalion, they were kind of the heroes of the whole show. Yes, they? and that's right. And and more than that, I think the New Zealand Army in particular, and possibly the Navy to some extent, but certainly the New Zealand Army has absorbed, because because they've had so many Maori servicemen, uh, they've absorbed a, a, a lot of the Maori ethos. And um, one of the reasons um, New Zealand soldiers are held in such high regard wherever they've gone overseas as peacekeeping forces or, or whatever um, uh, is I think that that kind of stems from that whole Māori ethos which has permeated the culture of the New Zealand Army. Um, somebody I know who volunteered for several years in um, East Timor where uh, where the New Zealand um, Army had a detachment serving with the peacekeeping forces, she told me that there was a very different attitude among the locals to the New Zealand servicemen than there was to the Australians who also had a contingent there. Completely different attitude and it was, a lot of it came from that, um, God, I don't want to indulge in racial stereotypes, I'll be shot, but but Maori, the New Zealanders were more relaxed, they were more informal, they related very easily and naturally with the local people and I think you can put that down to the, to the Maori influence and I know a, a former long-serving officer in the New Zealand Army who says exactly that. Um, and and you know, that's uh, that's uh, part of the character of the New Zealand Armed Forces comes from the Maori contribution. Yes, it's, it, you know, the, the, it seems to me I'm I'm not an historian, but it seems to me the history of this country is. I mean, there have been periods of conflict. There were the the wars mm-hmm. of the the late nineteenth century or the, the mid to late nineteenth century, and it's undoubtedly the case that some terrible atrocities were committed yeah. during those wars by the by the British Army. Um, yeah. and, but, and, but on but, both sides. And, and, and yeah. no doubt on both sides, and yeah. there were Māori on both yeah. sides and, yeah. so, and yeah. so on. Um, but but by and large, we're one of the more successful colonial stories of, of the world, and, and, and I think it is true that what New Zealand culture at large seems to be is massively informed by a Māori contribution. Yeah. Mm. I would I would agree with that, and I think that's a that's a good thing. That's un, a very good thing. unquestionably a very positive, and it's part of our national character, and it's something we should be proud of. Um, uh, but uh, you you know you raise a you raise another big point to me that you know New Zealand has a, a lot to be proud of. We are a we are a tolerant liberal society. Uh, there has been by international standards very little racial tension here. I stress by international standards, everything's relative. Um, We are universally admired for our respect for human rights. We have a a great deal to be proud of. We're a a very civilised country. Um, And yet we are constantly now, and I'm coming back now to the way the media presents things day after day, we are daily encouraged to see New Zealand as a society that's fatally tainted by 
racism, white supremacy, um, sexism, and a whole lot of other isms besides. And I, I just think that's a calumny. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's a fair reflection of New Zealand as a society. I've, I've reflected on this in, in a number of our, our podcasts, but it, it seems to me that the greatest kind of growth in liberal values, uh, you know, in the classical liberal sense, in terms of overcoming racism, sexism, liberalisation and of homosexual law and uh, to the point where homosexual people are treated just the same mm. as everybody else with regard to marriage and mm. all of that has happened in a, in a culture of free speech and a culture of yeah. the idea that we, we share ideas freely and, and that we have a, a general underpinning of agreement on what a democracy is and, ha and how you run that, as well as balance in the media. Um, so it seems to me, if anything, that the the proponents of this cancel culture of of, of hate speech laws and 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 the media that is seems to be becoming so so unipolar. Um, is going to undermine its own agenda if it's not careful. But the, it, once you start to pull down the, mm. the foundations of liberalism, mm. it threatens the very things yeah. that they they, who, they they purport to. Who knows what's going to be unleashed? And I come back to that column by or well, that blog post by Chris Trotter recently, uh, a warning of the potential of, of of an extreme right wing backlash, which no one no one wants. Um, I think he's being unduly pessimistic because, as I said before, I think New Zealanders are basically very moderate, um, restrained people. They're not given to, you know, rioting in the streets. Uh, but there is a tension that's built, a political tension that's building up there, and at some stage it's going to have to be released. Mm -hmm. And we just hope that that's not released in a, in a, in a damaging and um, destructive way. Yeah, I think that's exactly the metaphor, and it speaks to a mechanism we've discussed before on this podcast, which is just that, you know, one of the great things about free speech, besides that you get to sort of tease out ideas, it's just that it, um, it, it, it allows a vent, it allows people to actually mm -hmm. you know, blow off some steam and say what they're thinking and, and ideally um, feel um, a certain dignity in that. It doesn't mean that right, you have to accept their ideas yeah. or even that you have to agree with them. Yeah. But if we can build a culture where, you know, you can say, well, you know, I respect, I respect what you have to say, I hear what you have to say, mm -hmm. I think that goes a long way towards... Um, dealing with, as you say, this build-up of frustration. Mm, I'm sure you're right. And unfortunately at the moment everything is trending in the reverse direction. So we have, we're having a, sh a shutting down of, of free speech. You know, wouldn't it be nice if the Human Rights Commission included a commissioner for free speech? Yeah. Um, we have a commissioner for – we have a privacy commissioner. We have a commissioner for people with disabilities. We have a, a race relations commissioner. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Free speech is, is, I think we agree, is a, is a fundamental um, requirement for any liberal democracy. Maybe we take it so much for granted that we don't think we need a designated commissioner of free speech to uh, to uphold and defend and champion uh, we, we, freedom of speech. We might have but, had no inkling that we would until no, about five years ago. We do now. Most, we right? we, we yeah. most certainly do now. I, I, I would go, go even further. I, I have long toyed with the idea. I think that this is, is based on something John Stuart Mill said, but we should have a kind of uh, free speech champion, like a head dissident, and it could be kind of like a poet laureate, <laughs> yeah. and it would be someone who's paid by the state to make annoying arguments that go against the, the status quo. We used to have someone almost like that called the Wizard of Christchurch. Have you huh. heard of him? James? He's still around. He's, He's still around. Brackenry, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's still yeah. around. He still does his thing. Yes, he does. Yeah. He does. Mm. He's well in his, his, into his eighties now, but I think yeah. he's still on his um, soapbox, as it were, on a regular basis in the square. He's still very much a, an institution in Christchurch. And he, he, to me, exemplifies something about New Zealand as well, which is this yeah. place that. Although it has quite conservative bones, thro yes. throws up these kind yes. of strange and wacky dissidents who, who do fulfil the role that and you're talking who are, about, and who are embraced by the public. And who are quite, so we quite have a high tolerance yeah. of eccentricity and idiosyncrasy yeah. and quirkiness, 
Um, Ian Brackenbury Chanel, uh, to give him his full name, he 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 originally came to New Zealand from Melbourne. Yes. Um, he he couldn't find a sympathetic um, uh, audience in, in Melbourne, so he he fetched up in Christchurch, and they just took him to their heart. And so yes, it's a wonderful thing that we that we embrace uh, eccentrics like. I mean, he's a very very smart, well educated, well read man. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, how do we get onto the <laughs> Well, <laughs> J- J- James was saying that perhaps we need to have a, a kind of official dissident or, or person taking that that mantle. And um, yeah. I guess, you know, who would have thought that we need, even need to consider that? But here's another thing: uh, uh, for some reason, um, a couple of days ago, the name Patricia Bartlett. Um, jumped into my head. I must have seen a reference to her somewhere. Now, that name probably wouldn't mean much to you, but back she in the a, a concert, 60s and 70s, she, was, she led an organisation f- mm. called the Society for the Promotion of Community Standards. Um, and there was quite a battle raged uh, that raged in the late 60s and, and throughout the 70s on the right to access um what she would have viewed as pornography. Uh, um, and there was a very, very determined campaign from the basically the religious right uh, to limit people's access to any material that they felt was indecent or, or uh, compromised public morality, whatever. And, and she was in the thick of a lot of these battles and... Uh, and there was a back, there was a backlash against her, and uh, and she was subjected to a lot of ridicule. She was a very courageous woman, I have to say. She was re- subjected to enormous uh, ridicule. Well, but that was a battle over free speech, essentially. Um, the interesting thing is, paradoxically, that in a, in a funny sort of way, the people who are promoting wokeism now are kind of the ideological children of the people who were insisting. That Patricia Bartlett had no right to control what we watched in the movies or on TV or read in books, um, and so things in a funny sort of queer, in a w- weird sort of way have come full circle. We, we have reflected on that before. That the, okay. the kind of centre of gravity for the yeah. argument in favour of free speech has, has moved yeah. from the left to the right over the last forty years, uh, and, and you see that even more vividly at Berkeley University in the United yeah. States, which was the home of the free speech movement, and 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 now Berkeley is a kind of uh, an exemplar of wokeness. And do you, do you think that 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 phenomenon is attributable to the the, the the corner of politics that is ascendant at the time. So, you know, in the, at that time in the 60s and 70s, religious conservatism was a far stronger political force than it is now. And we'd had many years of the Holyoke government. Mm. Uh, there was a brief interregnum of mm. the, with the with the Kirk Rowling government yeah. followed by nine more years of, mm. of national, although... Calling Robert Muldoon right wing is a slightly contentious thing, considering how how socialist his, his economic well. Yes, he was were. a socialist in disguise, but but <laughs> but, but but in terms but of he was he was a social he was a social conservative. He was through socially through. conservative. Yeah. So so do you think that actually the people who are arguing against free speech tend to be the ones who hold the power at the times? Is I guess what I'm asking. Um. I said, look, I'd have to think about that. There's probably some truth in that. Um, uh, I'm trying to apply that uh, idea to our current situation. Um, certainly the people uh, controlling our institutions, our public institutions, and to some extent the people controlling government, although having said that, I'd have to acknowledge that um, I, I don't think there are many people in the government, the cabinet ministers, for example, or Jacinda Ardern, who is kind of actively encouraging this, this wokeism, but they're, but they're certainly not discouraging it. And so they've, they've, they've helped kind of create this climate of, of, of di- intolerance, of, of dissent. And they're threatening us with hate speech. And they're threatening us with hate speech and they're being very cagey about revealing exactly what these hate speech laws are likely to involve. And, I mean, that's going to be... If anything, I think that's going to be the big ideological kind of battle of the next couple of years. When we see what those hate speech laws look like, um, uh, I think most New Zealanders will instinctively think, hang on, this, as I say, we need to see 
what's involved, and I think Labor's being very cautious about coming out too prematurely and explaining exactly what they're proposing. But I think it's likely that when people see what what's involved, they will just instinctively say, "No, this is this is wrong." You know, we're we're a free country. We've historically, um, to a greater or less extent, uh, enjoyed free speech. There was a long battle through the '60s and, and '70s and '80s. Um, to secure free speech, no, we don't want to go back. The, the fact that they sorry, James, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think um, for me, I wasn't around, obviously, during, hopefully, obviously, during the 60s and 70s, but um, I think that's the main difference between the counterculture then and this new movement now. Um, the, the counterculture then was, was, okay, there were some extremists, but it was basically in favor of freedom, mm -hmm. in favor of free speech, in favor of social freedoms. Mm -hmm. And it's astonishing now that it's it's not... It's it's especially the young people who seem to have turned against free speech. And mm -hmm. as you say, Berkeley is a great example of this. Yeah. That you go from, you know, demonstrating at Berkeley for free speech to more recently demonstrating at Berkeley against free speech. Yeah, it's, um, it's just bizarre. It's, it's uh, almost grotesque. And I don't really know what's caused it either. And I think this the simple shift in power that the, the this cultural left is now in power so that they can enforce taboos and they're just tempted to because they're in power. I think that plays a, a, a large role. But I, I also think, and John Haidt, his is, is writings are quite good on this, there's also just a tendency in the human mind to, to boost your own side and to, and to um, have blind spots when it comes to things your own side is doing. So it, it's almost amazing that, you know, they're, they're very, the, the, the modern cultural left is actually quite open to freedom and free speech in certain contexts. The things that they associate with their side, they're very happy to defend mm. freedom. But when there are things that, don't look like they're on their side, well, then they're, they're against it. And we all do it, I and mean, the right mm. used to do it as well. Mm. But it's just such a powerful force. Um, and the only way of breaking it up is allowing everybody to discuss things and to criticize each other. So, I mean, I guess the, the hate speech law thing, um, depending on what's in them, but I, I expect there'll be things in them which, which do chip away at the free speech. It's not even really an, a, an ideological battle. It, it's sort of a, a battle for the possibility of having future ideological battles right because we can't mm -hmm. we can't discuss yeah, ideas well, at all we right. can't discuss you know socialism versus libertarianism mm -hmm. or state control mm -hmm. versus less state control or christianity versus whatever unless people can actually speak their minds yeah so yeah. Th th this actually brings us to what might be a, a good big question to to close with um you, you mentioned before that you're you think you're more optimistic than chris trotter on, on where things might head but when we take into account what James has just said, which, which I thoroughly agree with, actually what, what we need to do is band together with people like Chris Trotter, mm. irrespective of that he's a socialist and I'm a libertarian yes. or whatever, yes. in order to defend the ground on which yes. we can disagree about yes. those things. These really. ideas cut um, right across the normal ideological do you, lines. Do you think, um, bearing in mind what you've said about the fairly unique nature of what's going on, that, that liberal democracy is facing an existential threat? I most certainly do, um, which is a terrifying thought um, because we've sort of grown up with it. We've taken it for granted. Um, we go through periods where we're sort of backwards and forwards where, you know, I mean, the Muldoon, whom we talked about briefly before, classic example, you know, that was a period when you could say that um, New Zealanders' freedoms were were uh, compromised or um, circumscribed in, in various ways, but by and large, we have enjoyed the benefits of living in a in a, in a liberal democracy for a, for a long time. And, and 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 this is a country that, as I said before, is internationally admired as a tolerant, civilized society uh, that honours and recognises human rights. Um, and the thought that we're going to that we might lose such a fundamental uh, right as the as the right to express our legitimate opinions is a very, very scary one. Well, on that note, thank you very much indeed for joining us today, Carl. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thank and, you. Uh, I probably talk too much. I no, always do. No, indeed. That's why we got you on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Yeah. No, I appreciate the opportunity.